Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. There it is. I was dragging this morning, but now I'm feeling good. <laughs> Wednesday, idiotic day. Hope everybody's at home doing a little chair dancing. I don't really think we need to ask for weather reports today, do we? Isn't it just hot everywhere? It's just hot. Is there any place where it's not hot? Maybe we should just go asking for that. Well, we do have someone in the chat from the Northwest Territories today. Um, so it might not be as hot, but maybe comparatively hot. Hotter than normal, perhaps, but certainly yeah. not going to be Phoenix hot. Yeah. How do you pronounce that? Uh, Awatona? Aw- Awatna? <laughs> <laughs> The, the sad thing is, is uh, the only way that Kristen's going to be able to straighten that out for us is if she can type phonetically. So, <laughs> and we still won't know because we'll fumble it. Yeah, no kidding. Good morning, everybody. Hello, gang. Yes, it's a hot one. It's a scorcher here in uh, in Ottawa. One million degrees. I forgot to tell everybody in the chat when I posted that. That's one million degrees Kelvin. Okay, that is literally the surface of the sun here today. That's what it's going to be. Yeah. It, it, it... The world's tiniest harp <laughs> <laughs> playing my heart bleeds for you because we're only at about 114 today. So, but it's a dry heat, you know, <laughs> so they say, no kidding. We have hey, a folks. guest with us today, Chris, who's hanging out we with do. us? Folks, we have one of our favorite guests back. Um, and given today's topic, I will mention, I, I feel it's important that everyone understands clearly that Myra is all natural intelligence. There is no artificial intelligence. <laughs> nothing, nothing but natural intelligence going on here. <laughs> folks, it's, it's, it's Myra Roldan with us. Myra, there might actually be some folks with us here today who haven't met you on a past episode. So um, introduce yourself to the gang. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, it, has been, it feels like it's been decades since, this, since I've been on this show with you guys. Um, Thank you for having me again, for inviting me. I know we're trying to find some good dates, but uh, hi, everyone. I'm Myra Roldan. I'm a technologist, and um, my official title is Senior Technical Program Manager. I work for uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, where I lead a program on the artificial intelligence machine learning team uh, to democratize AI ML. So uh, that's kind of in a nutshell, the easiest way for me to to say what I do. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. what, do you, what do you mean? Oh, <laughs> let's just, let me start with a quick question. What do you mean by democratizing AI ML? Yeah. So, um, you know, when uh, ChatGPT, I'm sure everyone here has heard of it, right? At least, or some mention of it, because you're here today, you're curious. Um so, you know, when ChatGPT was released, it was released in research mode. Um, so it was made available to everyone and anyone who heard about it, right? So like if you have a phone or a laptop or a tablet, you could use this new technology, this generative AI um, that launched in November of 2022. So it's not even a year old yet. So I just mm-hmm. want to make sure that we're clear on that. Um, And so uh, democratizing AI ML, what that means is um, ensuring that uh, underserved communities and students from underserved communities. So think of like students in the Appalachia, students in Deep South, uh, students in the Caribbean, students um, in poor areas that don't have access to laptops or tablets who may have access to phone, right? 
can participate in this technology and can actually learn skills in order to land a job in AI ML, an entry level job in AI ML. I akin it to um, ed, uh, driver's ed. So um, we're not trying to create data scientists, right? We're trying to create um, ML ops and ML engineers and product managers who know how to use it and uh, executive assistants who can use it and manufacturing technicians who can use the technology. So it's making sure that they everyone has the skills and to use the technology responsibly and uh, ethically and, you know, and increase their productivity. Very cool. So when you, when the phrase democratizing AI, I, my brain went to, um, you know, the training models, making sure that those, the, the training models were, you know, as diverse and, and drawing from, you know, as broad a range of content rather than perhaps, you know, biased content, et cetera, too. So, um, yeah, so, so hear that, you hear that you're focused in the outward process. That's actually even super cooler. So, Chris, what's interesting is that outward focus does inform the models, right? So okay. when you focus on the people who gain access to the technology and learn how to use it, a lot of the models right now are using data that we're injecting into it to learn. And right. so when you have diverse representation, right? So if you only have people who have good jobs accessing the technology, um, you're the people that are left behind, that gap gets wider. And so by ensuring that they have access to it and they're using it and they're asking questions in the format that they would ask questions and looking for information that they're interested in, you're actually training the models and improving those models. So it's like a side effect. So instead of going like, we're going to train this model on like data that we think is right, you get people who actually are, you know, you, 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 so I have to say what we do for you without you, we do to you. And so we are trying to do it with them. Say that again, 10 times fast. I mean, actually, <laughs> slow, I mean, slower. Like uh, That's a great thing. Um, yeah. So what we do for you okay. without you, we do to you. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I'm a little slow this morning, everybody. That's only my third cup of coffee. I need yeah. at least four to comprehend our guests every Wednesday morning. <laughs> well, and coming off of a holiday yesterday too, and uh, in the that US, too, but, you know, <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta get back into the stride of things. Yeah, but it does make a lot of sense, and it does. So, from the technical conversation perspective, perhaps there might be a few folks in here who who need. A, just a mild one. We don't want to go too deep into the weeds. We discussed this and said we weren't going to, but there is this, the idea that you've touched on, but maybe just, if we just go a tiny bit deeper into the difference between the, the language, the, the stuff that happens when you interact with the tool trains the tool. And that's what it then gives back to you is based on all of the things that it learns from the people interacting with it yes and then there's probably more to it so help me out there <laughs> there is a ton so what i'm gonna do is let me share i'm gonna share my screen let's say we, we tested this so let's see if it works now <laughs> fingers here's the, crossed everyone here's where the natural intelligence kicks in <laughs> <laughs> yes and, and we're hoping the crowdcast natural intelligence uh, kicked in or oh, made wait. everything work Look at that there we go all right Okay, so this is, uh, I, I do these workshops also to help people understand AI ML. And I don't know if you guys know this, but I have been, um, I tried to do a workshop at ATDTK in 2018, I think it was 2018, 2019, around machine learning. And people were like, well, I don't have, like, how does it apply to me? Like, why do I even need to know this, Myra? Um, <laughs> and it was fun for the people who attended. Um, but now, those same people, a lot of them are instant experts. And I have, I, I take, I'm going to do some digs today just because I take issue with it. But um, <laughs> so what is like generative AI, right? So first of all, you need to understand what AI is um, because generative AI is just AI. Um, and so there's this um, model that we use or this graphic that we use to explain what AI is. So uh, in simple terms, right? I'm not going to read like it to you. You can read it. Um, but basically, 
machine learning and deep learning are subsets of AI. Generative AI falls under the AI umbrella, right? Uh, machine learning is like the, the engine and deep learning is the way uh, it learns like that, that car learns. So think of it as a self-driving car. The self-driving car is the AI. The machine learning is the engine that's feeding it. Um, and then it's getting all its information from that deep learning. Right. So okay. uh, when you work with a generative AI model, you're working at the deep learning level. So it's when you ask it something, it goes into the AI, the machine does something with it, and then it learns from it, and then it spits something back out to you. Um, so, uh, and I have a better graphic for that. Let's see. I have my slide numbers. Uh, here we go. So this is like the history of generative AI. I just want people to be aware, like, it's not new. I mean, it's not new. Yeah. right now but it is really new generative ai ai was created in the 1920s um generative ai was created in 2022 so it is still very new and this is kind of all the launches and and just so you can see the exponential growth of it and it's still growing so the, i only went up to april 13th which is uh when amazon launched bedrock um and there's other things that have happened since then Right. So this is a journey of what generative AI is looking like. Now, is this blurry for you guys? Can you guys see this? Okay. Cause I'm happy to share this afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, a terrible version would be fabulous. Cause uh, yeah, yeah. The folks are on a little smaller screen or whatever today. I'm, yeah. I can see it, but barely. I know. Yeah, so shoot it, it over to me. I'll make sure everybody gets it. Perfect. Cool, so cool. it's the history of generative AI starts with open AI, right? They created, um, generative AI, the open AI chat GPT, but it actually started with Google in 2017. So I did, so I love this story. So Google created a large language model in 2017. And because it did not align with their product offering, they ditched it. They just didn't even launch it um, because it didn't align with their market. You know, it's the marketing wheel. Sure. So yeah. they ditched it. So open AI built ChatGPT on top of Google's transformer model that they ditched. <laughs> so, wow. Okay. I know, I know. Right. It's, it's super interesting. Um, but you know, we're talking about like, what is, uh, hold on. I got a better model. Let's see. I want to show you what happens in the back end. Okay. So when you're working with generative AI, I'm going to see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you guys. So this is, there's things that happen. I won't make me let, let me make it bigger. Let's see this. Here we go. So when you work with generative AI, I have this little graphic here, stick figures, because that's all I can draw. I love it. They're good <laughs> ones. So when you you're the user up here, right? So you go and you open up ChatGPT or whatever platform you're using, Bard, Anthropic. And there's a ton of other ones, right? And you ask it a question, like you're like, I want to know, like, I don't know, distance from the uh earth to like jupiter right things that are hard for us to calculate very quickly or pull from a rolodex um this is what happens in the back end you, that information is sent to a back end server that collects it right and then it does some pre-processing so it has to like put that data because the information you enter is considered data uh, it has to do some pre-processing with it and then it sends that processing to the large language model and then the large language model does some processing and it does some computation. It's all math. So turning text into ones and zeros. And uh, so it no longer needs to turn it into binary. It now can just read your text, but it reads your text um, based on tokens. So there's a token value to the letters in a word. Um, and so like, let's say you have a thousand tokens, right? And you can only process a thousand tokens at a time. It means that you can't put in like a monolithic uh, writing into this thing because it won't be able to, you don't have enough tokens to process it. Because um, it costs, this is a really expensive process to do this. Uh, so then the machine processes it, it sends it back to the, to the backend server and then it delivers the output to you. And that happens like in seconds, this yeah. whole process, right? Like it's like, Oop, bloop, 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 really fast. Um, so I, I know that a lot of people can't see the screen I'm seeing in the, in the chat. I will make sure that you guys get a copy of this so you can share it. 
Um, but this is like what happens in the back end server. So it's not, this is not green technology. I want everyone to know that. So if you are like, save the earth, green only, let's go green. And you're using chat GPT. I'm going to tell you like you are losing. (laughs) (laughs) It is not a green technology. It takes so much compute power and processing power to be able to, um, process one prompt uh and it costs millions of dollars to actually train these models and it takes like huge amounts of like i said computing it's not green technology guys sorry about that so uh i'm gonna i'm gonna stop screen sharing because uh i want this to be a screen share moment for everything but i figured we could like just go over this really quick and give you guys an idea or visual of that, that helps a lot. Yeah. I mean, I, we, yeah, we weren't going to go down too far down that technical road. Cause I, I did want to kind of have the conversation about how do we think about this? Because there's, I think there's two lines of thought, especially in our industry, but probably in general. So there are the folks, instructional designers and the developers and the e-learning folks and everything saying, you know, having fun, learning how to write prompts, becoming a prompt engineer and just engaging in it, right? Getting, creating photos. Let's say you can't find a stock photo that you need. So you go to mid journey and you tell it what you need and it builds a photo for you. And sometimes it gets a a good one. Sometimes maybe not so much uh, with an an eight fingered hand or whatever the issues are with that. I think, I hope they've fixed that by now, but maybe not. But then there's then there's the higher level stuff and there's probably managers, senior level managers, mid-level managers, training department managers that are also thinking, okay, this, this AI thing is going to impact us. There's, we've got work we have to do internally. My people are probably going to start using it, but what does this mean for us as a training team, as an organization, as do you know, when do I pull the trigger on something like this? What if, when I'm talking to vendors and they're trying to sell me something that's called AI, just like all of that stuff, I'm certain is clouding a lot of minds. So is there anything we can do to uncloud it or is it just the nature of a new tech? No, no, there's a, there's, so I think therein lies the, um, the crux of everything, right? It's like, what do we do with it? How do we incorporate it? So right now, I talked to a lot of, um, I've been doing a lot of consulting around uh, building generative AI strategy. Um, And so outside, I'm a consultant, I still have a side gig where I moonlight as a consultant and help organizations. And so uh, the biggest conversation I've been having is uh, companies are afraid of being left behind. Right. So because they're being told, if you don't adopt this new technology, you will be left behind. Right. Um, And Brent, doesn't that sound familiar? Like when remember, like I think we are all old enough right now to remember dial up. Right. And and to remember um, like when the Internet was born. Right. And everyone was like, what's this thing, the Internet? And then it turned into the wild, wild west. Do you remember that? Oh, oh yeah. The Internet as wild, wild west. Yeah. This is the this is the next evolution of the Internet. We all thought it was going to be Web3 and blockchain. No, this is it. This is this is it. Um, And so uh, one thing that I think is really important that everyone be conscious of is uh the issues around privacy security right um and ethics so when uh you use chat gpt the web interface of chat gpt Mm -hmm. at least let me see if i can pull this up because i think this is this is going to be important um to know the difference in what you're using. Let me just log in first. Cause I don't, you guys don't need to see my login. <laughs> now we'll skip that. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to see my login. No. Uh, okay. So when you just for visuals, and so I'm not going to share anything that's groundbreaking or anything. This is just, um, okay. So I wonder, I'm going to share a window so you can see what I'm sharing. Okay. So, okay. This is ChatGPT, right? Yep. This, 
remember this i feel like i'm going to do a, a commercial like this is chat gpt <laughs> this is your brain on chat gpt right <laughs> uh, so this oh is the flashbacks i know i i think we it's too old school, right so when you use chat gpt guys any information you put into chat gpt open ai reserves the right to use that information to train the model it is not private you your data is being used okay so as an organization your privacy and data sharing um this is risky so if you're using this interface for work and you're putting in work information in here you could be potentially giving out trade secrets you could potentially be putting the organization at risk you could potentially be um doing something that's unethical and not aware of it right like if there's some kind of yeah. like ideology within your organization and stuff like that, um, you uh, may be, you know, um, putting things at risk. Now, if you use, this is the OpenAI platform, the API, okay? So if you go to the OpenAI API, there's this, uh, so when you have an account with OpenAI, you get your keys under personal view API keys. I've built a few apps. Um, so these are uh, API keys that I've used. Um, but if you use the playground here or the API, OpenAI does not use this data to train the models. Good to know. Right. Um, okay. This is so, still questionable, right? So is, it, is, is this... Empty, like it has no models or anything, and you're starting from scratch, you're putting stuff in. So it has a baseline of, of of a model. It has access to the same model that the web interface does. It's the same. Oh, model. okay. Yeah, it's one model. It's not. It's just what they do with your data. Oh, okay. Right. So data used through the API key. Um, here in the playground is still questionable, and may still they may still use this for training. But if you use your API key and you create an app. Right. They don't use that data to, to train a model. So is that, so I, I think um, maybe Chris, this is what you were thinking. I don't know, but um, like I, we hear a lot about like private AI and stuff like that, but the, there has to be some sort of basic model in the background that the system where it knows how to respond in general, before you start giving it your access to your company's information or whatever, so that you can have a smart AI internally that's private to your company. So right? you can, yeah, so you can build a private large language model that is super expensive. You still need to base it on. So what you can do is you can use ChatGPT or OpenAI's large language model right. and use the API to build your app. So you're on not building the, the large language model. You're building right. an app on top of that. Right. You're using the API key. Okay. If you, if an organization wants to build their own large language model, expect that it's not cheap because you need high GPUs to be able to do that. Yeah, you can use cloud because you get access to the GPU and you don't need to uh, buy it, but GPU is expensive. Yeah. Uh, so it's processing. It's a processor, general, general processing unit. Um, and that is really expensive because you can't, you need more than one, you need a couple hundred to be able to train a large language model. Um, okay. So creating your own large language model is expensive. However, if you use an existing large language model and use an API, you can add additional information to that language model about your organization, but you want to make sure you're not doing it in a public application. Gotcha. Okay. So it, that's a good strategic yeah. thing for for people to know the the security aspect mm -hmm. of it to be sure to at least if none of that made any sense to you folks in the chat it, it's okay just yeah. know that it's a concern <laughs> and that when you start to think about it and go down this road be sure that there is a column on your whiteboard for brainstorming security Let's and privacy and mm -hmm. privacy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so and if you're if you're privacy. if you're vetting vendors ask them for their data sharing and privacy policies um and have your IT department review that and your awesome. legal department review it also. Like you don't okay. need to know it, right? Like that's why you have departments in your organization that are like went to school for stuff to understand the lingo and right. Like we're not bringing your IT guy and your attorney and the uh, company attorneys too. <laughs> and the company attorney, right? Oh my gosh. 
So what, so what, so you mentioned also, um, the ethical responsibilities are important. Yeah. What, how, how should a, you know, why, why does a CLO need to be concerned about that? Um, so there's no good way for me to say this. So I'm just going to say it. <laughs> so generative AI, right. Was built by predominantly 35 year old white males, right? So it's okay. a very uh, skewed view of the world, right? It's not uh, an entirely representative view of the world. And so we are all biased. I don't care what, and if I, if someone walks up to me and says like, I'm not biased, I will call bullshit on you because we're all biased. We all have some kind of bias that we carry and it can, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or you live in the ghetto or you live in a mansion. We all have our own biases, right? And so when you are, when you're using um, an AI model, organizations have internal biases, right? Um, I work in tech. Tech is a male dominated industry, right? There are a lot of biases towards females, towards black and browns, towards minorities in general. And so, uh, and it's not intentional. A lot of time it's lack of understanding, right? And lack of um, diversity of thought and lack of like a lot of other things. And so that gets injected into these models, right? And so when you um, start using a model, and I know that a lot of people at the beginning when they were using ChatGPT, they would like enter prompts and they'd be like, it didn't answer my question correctly or it didn't do this. It's, but where you're helping it is like you're, you're teaching this model thing. So if you're trying to teach it to be a bad actor, right? Yeah. Um, it's going to learn that. And so ChatGPT has started um, uh, really uh, putting filters on that. So like you can't make ChatGPT um, do bad things. It has like a filter in it and the public right. uh, version of it. So um Oh, and it, I'm being a leftist. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. I, I will take that. Um, but uh, yeah, so we all have bias. And so it just gets injected into and So ethical issues around ChatGPT could be, um, you know, you're using it to write a, a paper and it could be skewed towards one population or another and put a population that's at disadvantage at greater disadvantage. And so, um, and we're not talking about any particular group. It could be any group. So, yeah. So there was it's not, uh, there were three items. So we we talked about what was the third one again? I forget. We talked about security and 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 privacy and, and ethics. ethics. And yes. what was the other one? Wasn't there in third? That's yes, three. It's privacy, security, ethics. So P E. Gotcha. Okay. So we did. We kind of mixed privacy and security together, and the ethics side of it. So what can um, from a, somebody mentioned earlier, uh, I know we, we're not going to get in the weeds, but we'll just keep it, still keep it eye level. But, um, in our world, the LMS, right. It contains a lot of content, right. A, a lot of information that somebody has deemed necessary that people across the organization need to know. Can we, um, uh, you know, uh, allow an AI to access all of that training to train the AI so that when people ask questions, they get answers from the AI, but it's pulled from all of the training documents or maybe the technical specs. Maybe there's a bunch of tech specs out there, right? A do big document library repository where all the official stuff rests. Is that what we need to start thinking about is that our responsibility in L and D or is that it could somebody be. else? And we wait. No, it could be. So let me, I'm, again, I'm going to screen share. All right. Let's see if this will work this time. Okay, here we go. So, and, and Brent, I'm going to tell you, like I, I was reading the chat just now. I saw some comments about someone calling me a leftist and that it was BS and stuff. I think everyone's entitled to their opinion. Right. Um, and uh, I'm glad that whoever that was, that their texts are in China and in India. Um, but there's also bias in those countries. So, like, 
bias and bias out guys. Um, anyway, so let's go back to this knowledge base. So this is Cora. So uh, what I did here is uh, um, I built some knowledge bases. So let's look at one of these just so you can see what a knowledge base could look like. So this is a knowledge base that I built um, on. I just fed it like YouTube videos and I, you, you know, fed it like docs and stuff that I have. So I can go in here and ask it a question. Um, what can I search for? Let's see what so it tells us. So th this is this is what you were talking about when you said there's a there's a language model that's already built, but you fed yeah. it some additional information specific that it went and it gathered and it consumed, and now you're able to ask its things and it's going to answer because in a it way has the information that it, that it has yeah from that data that it has gathered that you have given it. Yeah. So this is uh, so I asked it a question. This is Cora. So I had launched and you couldn't see it. So core AI, so I asked it a question and it, because I fed it like YouTube videos and stuff like that, that I own. So I didn't just feed it anything. This is content that I've created and it's public content, right? So that's the other okay. key. This is public content. So what it does is it started searching through my documents to see. So let's see here. Um, uh, add uh, a GPT to spreadsheet. What it's going to do is going to search the knowledge base that I created, and it's going to go to specific areas and to specific sections, like within videos, okay. to to show. And you'll see here. You're not going to be able to hear it, but you'll see that it'll it will jump to a specific segment. Do you see at the Select bottom go. and paste? Literally, that's all you're doing. So it goes to the specific section of a video to answer a question. Hmm. And all I did was upload like YouTube videos to create this knowledge base. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So, so w knowing that that's possible, mm -hmm. and, and I think that kind of helps answer some of the questions that have shown up in the chat, right? Like, what do we need to think about and how we need to do it? So, um, there's a bunch of questions in here, and I'm sorry, folks, if we can't get to all of them, but Susan has a good one, a very general question, which I like. How could I leverage generative AI to make our L&D processes work more efficient and more productive? And maybe doing what you just did is one way? Yeah, I think another way would be to like actually help you write the process. Uh -huh. Right. So I know we're all thinking like, how do we streamline our processes? I mean, you can use generative AI to figure out like, what is the process, right? Do you need new processes? Like, do you need a new intake process? You can ask it to like, help me. Like, this is our process right now, high level. You don't have to put in company data if you're using like the public version and just say like, this is our process right now for intake. Help me create a better intake process for like new projects. Right. And you can give it some like uh, parameters or limitations that you have. So and you have can drop in a list that. or a, a, yeah. uh, what you currently have, like a Word doc or a spreadsheet that said yep. that you typically send out to different departments. Hey, if you want some training, custom training built, here's all the th questions we need answered. You could take something like that, put it into that system. And then the system would come back and say, ah, you should also maybe kind of ask this or this is a great question, but not so much this one. And it rewrites it for you. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, it just asks it to improve the process, help you not even rewrite it, help me improve this process. Right. Or identify where my potential bottlenecks are um, to work around like creating more efficient processes. Right. Everyone's worried about like, how do I use it to create? But like, look at your, look at your processes first to figure out like, are there gaps in your process that you can improve and have it give you suggestions for how to improve it. Right. And yeah. then working backwards from like the start, like how do you how do, like how do you even take in projects? How do you evaluate those projects to like figure out does your team have the bandwidth or not? And then you can really think about like okay, how do we um, then use generative AI to improve some of those processes? But also working with your IT departments to understand what can you use and what can't you use. And I'll tell you like. The majority of a, uh, generative AI adoption right now in the workplace is around tools that everyone's already using. So think like Microsoft Office, uh, you know, with Outlook, Word, Excel, um, 
if you're using uh, search like Bing or Google, you have access to generative AI. Um, uh, there's a ton of tools. If you're using Zapier, there's plug you know, it's a plugin for generative AI that you can do to like create a workflow. So it's not like you don't have to learn how to use new groundbreaking tools to get started with it. You have tools at your hand that you're already using that your company has already approved. And you just need to make sure that they are um, approving use of generative AI within that tool. So it it goes back to like, what is the company doing? Right. And Heather's got a great follow up question, too. So and this this is a good way to circle around. Heather, thank you for asking. So what we just talked about, about putting in that spreadsheet or whatever does mm-hmm. sound like, hey, that's yeah. too much information going out there. So we need to be aware of that. Are we putting that spreadsheet into something that's public that's going to now be used to train the public language model? Or are we putting it into a private playground or sandbox or other other area this is why these differences are important Heather and it it is it's a great question but this is where it all ties together in that privacy and security and having that understanding yeah Mm -hmm. and I agree like I wouldn't put in a whole spreadsheet I would put in and I wouldn't even what I would do is like I would write out like here like this is our intake process for projects help me improve this process right and I would just write out like kind of steps you don't have to get really specific and just say like this is our intake how can we improve this and then you can take what the model's telling you and you can modify it right like it's not going to give you the silver bullet but you should be able to modify it to be able to uh, work to your advantage yeah there have been a couple of examples thrown into the chat of of ways that people have either been using it or or, or thinking Mm -hmm. about using it um and we've we've heard some of these before, you know, using it for generating test questions, for example, mm-hmm. or learning objectives, um, or even potentially going the whole hog of getting it to generate all of the content for a course, um, <clears throat> pointing out someone and there's pointing out that, uh, yeah, you got to be able to clean it up. Uh, <laughs> you can't yeah. assume that it's going to be what you want. <clears throat> but we have actually, uh, we have a client team that are using it uh, within their Domino One content courses. So um, two ways they've got it. Uh, they're using AI as a mini chat bot on pages. Do you have any questions about the information on this? And um, and so the learner can type that in while they're in, uh, you know, a SCORM course, just to, for clarification. Yeah. So I think there is some um, element. As well, also as a, as, a, as a feedback engine too. Yeah. As you can see, the, a feedback engine too. So, so more elaborate things that someone might say, what, what are your thoughts on this? And so the learner will type in something and then the AI will generate um, you know, some feedback back to them about that as well in process. Yeah. And so there are some LMSs that are starting to integrate, you know, AI into it. And so um, <clears throat> there are LMSs that do have AI built in. They don't have generative AI built in. So there is a difference between like what AI can do and what generative AI can't do or you know, what, it, what it can and can't do. So for traditional AI, think of it as a ch- traditional AI can solve like very specific problems, right? You give it a problem, it's usually rule-based, it's pre- it has pre-programmed um, uh, instructions to achieve a specific goal, right? So let's say, uh, I like to use a glove manufacturer. So if you're a glove manufacturer, you put in specific rules to have the system uh, define, you know, defining what constitutes a defect in a product, and it will search for those defects, and then, you know, kind of call those out. Where generative AI, on the other hand, um, has the ability to to create and design new content, right? And it uses machine learning uh, to learn from the data and then generate that new content um, that it was trained on. So it's not rule based, right? It's more like a free for all kind of deal, like Wild Wild <laughs> West. Um, but the glove manufacturer could then use that data to create new prototypes of gloves, mm. right? You would still need to run it through that. Um, it, what like once they decide which one they're going to manu- manufacture, they would still need to put it through like the AI model to to identify defects, like using uh, image recognition, computer vision kind of deal to to quickly pick out defects that would be missed by a human eye, right? Yep, yep. We, we, I remember trying to do that, something similar, 
uh, in the semiconductor industry, identifying defects in uh, as the wafers would go by, taking pictures of them, and then using that in, for the training department to build back in then it was CBTs, right? To how to train people to spot what a defect looks like and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now it doesn't take six months to create something like that. You just <laughs> get the well, chat think, GPT or something to do it. Yeah. So think now with, with that, right? So you just said that you guys took images to be able to create training, to teach a human how to identify defects. Yeah. So now the role of that human has changed. Right. So they're no longer having to identify defects. They are now having to run the equipment and maintain the equipment, the hardware that is used to quickly identify defects. Right. Because AI still has to sit within a, a machine. Right. That machine still requires maintenance. That machine still requires the software within there need, requires maintenance. Also, it's not self-maintaining. And so. Uh, there is just uh, the role of the human has changed to yeah. now ensuring that that hardware and that software is still working and that it's actually you still have to like vet the actual product to make sure that it is it really identifying the defects. <laughs> right. Or is it is it going rogue? So there's still you're, there's still need for human intervention and ensuring that there's quality control. Yeah, we are uh, we are approaching our the end of our time, and that 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 flew by. But I do have one final question, our our parting question: <laughs> Do we have to worry about our jobs? I get this question asked to me a lot. Does instructional design, does training, does L and D in general, it, it, you know, do people need to be worried? What's your take? I would say. Being worried, if you're not worried um, and you're not scared, then I think you don't understand the, the full impact of this, right? Um, but I think that, yeah, you should be worried. Uh, and I'm not going to be an, al an alarmist here. Yes, you should be worried um, because you should be worried and understanding about like how is your role going to change, right? It's not that you're going to lose your job that you're going to be replaced by technology, but there's going to be a shift in your role. Um, and you need to understand what that shift means. And are there skills that you need to learn in order to, uh, you know, to continue on? So like, think about, okay, I'm going to date myself. Think about like Fortran programmers, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the computers, uh, before computers were people. Uh, and if you've seen like the movie Hidden Images, where there were women in back rooms doing like huge math calculations. They were like mathematicians doing like all the calculations manually. Um, and so uh, their role changed with the onset of computers, right? So yeah. they had these big servers that came in and they had to shift from doing things manually to then understanding how to program these big machines, right? And the people that learned that were the ones who were able to ride the wave. Right. And understand that there's a shift in the way you do things. Um, and you need to just be prepared for that. Like, how do you prepare for that? Mm -hmm. Sarah's, <clears throat> Sarah's rephrased the question or the idea. I think worried is maybe the wrong word. We need to be aware. It absolutely yes. will impact us, but that could be a good thing or a bad thing. It all depends on how you react to it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And if you haven't seen the movie Hidden Image, I highly recommend that you guys all see it because that is like the perfect flow of how jobs changed. We love it. We love it. Thank Very you, Myra. Cool. Yeah, Myra, thanks so much. As always, <clears throat> awesome conversation when you when you join us here on Idiotic. Um, drop your uh, contact info for people oh, yeah. to find you, that sort of stuff, into the chat. And um, Myra's going to share the slides. There's going to be some questions in the chat. Myra will share the, the info that she, the visual pieces, and we'll put that access to that up on the, the blog post that we'll be following in today's episode as well. Folks, what we get to do here on Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is sponsored by Domino, makers of Domino One. Um, and I will throw a little link into the chat. There's also the big green button under things, uh, under the uh, whole display here if you want to check us out there. And you can also join us in our LinkedIn group. I just dropped a link in the chat as well. Hang out there. Hey, you know what? If you want to carry on this conversation, that's a good place to do it. Even if you want to be contrarian or uh, have any sort of uh, negative attitude.
about uh, AI. Feel free to continue to chat elsewhere. <laughs> we love it. The chat room, you guys are awesome today. Thank you so much, Mike. Have a great week, everybody.